Good evening, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to introduce today's esteemed plenary speaker and latest chemistry Nobel laureate, Professor Benjamin List from Max Planck Institute. Professor List is born in Germany and did his education in Berlin and obtained his PhD in Frankfurt before moving to the States for his postdoctoral training at the Scripps Research Institute with Professor Carlos Barbaros III and the late Professor Richard Lerner. He then stayed on as assistant professor in Scripps for four years before moving back to Germany, where he joined Max Planck Institute as a group leader in 2003. Since 2005, he became the director of homogeneous catalysis department at the Max Planck Institute for co-research, a position that he holds currently still. Professor Lee's research focus is in the development of a branch of catalysis based not on enzyme or metals, but on small organic molecules termed asymmetric organocatalysis as an approach to construct more efficiently and sustainably anything from new pharmaceuticals to molecules that can capture light in solar cells. For his achievement and pioneering efforts to develop this field of catalysis, he was awarded the 2021 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which he shared with Professor David McMillan, who also arrived at this method independently. Excitingly, Professor Lee has recently developed a new class of highly reactive organocatalysts called strong and confined acids, which are being used in unprecedented transformations and helping to solve some of the relevant problems in chemical catalysis and synthesis. I'm sure he will share with us more shortly. Professor Lee also received numerous awards for his research achievements and most recently, he has been named the latest 2022 recipients for the Herbert C. Brown Award for Creative Research in Synthetic Methods. Without further ado, let us welcome Professor List for his lecture on chemical catalysis as enabling science and technology for mankind. Professor List, please. Yeah, thank you so much for this super kind introduction. Um, it's my true pleasure to be with you today. I would rather be in Singapore, actually. It's a German wintertime, and I almost slipped on my way to the Institute because the streets are so icy. And I really enjoy uh, being in Singapore every time I'm there. And I look forward to coming again, hopefully, uh, next year. Um, in any case, I would like to use this opportunity today to speak about catalysis because it's, for me at least, it's the most interesting science one, one can pursue. And um, I like to talk about catalysis in a broader context, not only as a science, but also to share with you a little bit um, catalysis as a technology, because I think it is as a technology somewhat underappreciated. People are well aware of, you know, the internet and uh, farming and, and, and things like this, but they're not aware of the true relevance of catalysis. And that's my message uh, for you today. And I would like to start out with the single most favorite reaction uh, for me, and that is photosynthesis, actually. You might be surprised, but photosynthesis for me is really the most beautiful chemical reaction in the universe because in photosynthesis, um, Enzymes, biological catalysts, convert very unreactive chemicals, CO2 and water, in the presence of light to form carbohydrates. I, I have abbreviated them CH2O. And this is kind of uh, um, how, how the name also suggests their structure. And oxygen. So photosynthesis delivers the stuff we need to eat and the air we need to breathe. It's, that's why I think it's the most important chemical reaction uh, in the universe. And in fact, oxygen, the only source of oxygen on the planet is photosynthesis. And it happens in the leaves of plants as shown here, uh, the moss actually, the chloroplasts, you see these little uh, green uh, balls here in that, and these balls 
uh, uh, carbohydrates and oxygen is generated. And glucose is just one example of such a carbohydrate, a hexamer, so to say, of CH2O. And so this chemistry is only enabled through the magic of catalysts. And that is why, why uh, catalysis uh, is, for me at least, a uh, really fascinating science. And I, I came up with this idea, and, and I'm still fascinated with this, that catalysis, and that's why, why, why this is kind of uh, magic for me, is just a single molecule away from, from a magical transformation. Uh, in which you, for example, convert two compounds, A and B, to a third compound, C. And with magic, you would just use a magical stick or, or say, a, say a few words. But with catalysis, one molecule in principle would be enough to, to do this, this process. And, and it functions because the catalyst does not appear on either side of the reaction equation. It is actually not being consumed in the process. And that's that what, what realized this magic, actually. And the catalyst uh, facilitates this chemical process by lowering the activation energy and providing an alternative pathway to the product, which requires less uh, activation energy. So this is basically, in a nutshell, uh, what, what fascinates me uh, about the science of catalysis. But the beauty of this area is that it is not only a science, I've mentioned this before, but it also is a technology and it has been a key technology for sustaining our life on this planet during the last hundred years or so. Um, and, and I like to say catalysis uh, feeds, heals, warms, transports us actually. But catalysis, uh, without doubt, will also play a huge role uh, in the future for our life on this planet. And for example, in mitigating climate change, the global warming, of course, is a problem. And uh, I, would, I would be not surprised if also in the future, catalysis will really be playing a very important role in addressing uh, these challenges. And just to show you a little bit about um, the history of catalysis, why I think it is a somewhat underappreciated technology, I'd like to show you three examples of very, very important fundamental chemical catalytic processes that have in, enabled our human life on this planet. Haber-Bosch, of course, is uh, the number one important reaction. It's kind of the, the human equivalent of photosynthesis in a way, probably the most important chemical catalytic process we currently pursue on this on, uh, on, on Earth. And it was discovered by Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, both received the Nobel Prize uh, in different years. And it involves the, the conversion of nitrogen and hydrogen gas in the presence of an iron catalyst to ammonia. And this process is so incredibly important because ammonia is then converted in a second catalytic process, the so-called Oswald process in the, in the presence of yet another catalyst uh, combination with platinum and rhodium to HNO3. And from HNO3, of course, nitrates are made and nitrates in fact are key fertilizers. And uh, that's why this reaction has also been called bread from air because you need the fertilizer, of course, to grow the plants on the earth. And the plants, we are not only eating those plants, but they also serve as, as uh, food for our animals. And, and that's why actually this, the growth in ammonia production over the years, this is actually showing the ammonia production from 1946 until 2007, nicely correlates with the growth of the world population. I find this pretty amazing. I, I, found these graphics, uh, coincidentally, it's kind of the same time span from the 40s until the early 2000s. And you see how the world population grew from, you know, like 1 billion to where we are today, 7 billion. And, and this literally correlates almost one-to-one -one with the ammonia production. So in fact, in our bodies, we have uh, a, a large portion of all the nitrogen atoms in our body come from this chemical process. So in a way, you could say humans are partially synthetic, which I find kind of fascinating, if you didn't know this, this already. The second chemical reaction I wanted to share with you today, the second catalytic chemical reaction is cracking. And um, I, this is something I also learned actually relatively late in my career. Cracking is probably one of the most important and large-scale processes uh, on Earth. 
And in catalytic cracking, what happens is you take these long chain alkane compounds that are uh, distilled off from crude oil. And those can then, in the presence of a zeolite, very strong um, uh, mineral material, aluminum silicate, at very high temperature, uh, be cleaved. So you, this is basically a, a, um, um, a carbon carbon bond cleaving transformation in which an alkene and an alkane is formed. And this is, of course, the synthetic method how to make fuel material, gasoline, right? And of course, I'm, I mean, it's not maybe a chemical reaction of the future, but for many, many years, this has enabled, of course, our, our driving our cars and flying our planes and so on. And it is still one of the most important chemical reactions conducted on the planet. In fact, larger than 1.5 million cubic meters uh, of this feedstock material is converted literally every day, amounting to almost close to a billion ton or so of material that is uh, converted every year. One of the, as I said, most important chemical reaction on the planet. <clears throat> and the last one of this type I wanted to share with you <clears throat> is the, the Zika Nutter polymerization of either ethylene or propylene. And I like to show this, of course, because it was discovered by Karl Ziegler. He was a director at the institute where I am here right now, the Max Planck Institute for Coal and Forschung, Coal Research. And Ziegler discovered this uh, propyl propylene polymerization and ethylene polymerization back in 1953 and uh, received a Nobel Prize in 1963. And as you can see, many, many materials, important materials can be made from, from this. And this, people have said this was this mark, this discovery marked the beginning uh, of the plastic age. Now, <clears throat> if you think about it, you can kind of summarize the science of catalysis with the Nobel Prizes that were given to this area starting actually with the first Nobel Prize to a catalysis researcher that was Oswald actually in 1909. And Oswald um, was kind of laying the foundations for the science of catalysis, the physical uh, chemical aspect of catalysis. Oswald was a real pioneer and he understood, for example, that enzymes, biological catalysts are by no means different to the chemical catalysts. And, and another aspect of Oswald is actually that in 1905, in a book review, actually, he already predicted that maybe one day chemists will be able to design organic catalysts, and he really called them organic catalysts, to, to catalyze chemical reactions like enzymes, but with higher thermic stability. So he was really a visionary, I would say. But the surprising thing then was that, and this is reflected with the many Nobel Prize winners that uh, were, were um, honored uh, for their work on catalysis in the subsequent years. There were in fact 17 prize, prize winners. Almost all of them actually used transition metals as catalysts. And this started out with Sabatier, of course, finely dispersed uh, transition metal catalyzed hydrogenation reactions. Haber and Bosch, I already mentioned. Bergius hydrogenated coal actually to make alkanes. Uh, and these are all heterogeneous transition metal catalyzed processes. And then until Ziegler and Nutter in 1963 utilized homogeneous uh, catalysts and, and again, transition metal catalysts actually, this marked the beginning of the area of homogeneous transition metal catal catalysis. And there were a few other Nobel prizes given to this uh, general area, Knowles, Sharpless and Noyori, of course, for their work on asymmetric catalysis with chiral transition metal complexes. Chauvin, Schrock, and Grubbs for um, olefin metathesis using homogeneous transition metal catalysts. And then, of course, Heck, Nagishi, and Suzuki for uh, palladium catalyzed cross coupling reactions, again utilizing homogeneous transition metal complexes. So you can basically see that until this recent Nobel Prize three years ago to Francis Arnold utilizing enzymes, uh, directed evolution of enzymes, the entire century was focused on transition metal catalysis. And I like to say, therefore, that you can call this century basically a century of transition metal catalysis. And so this may now uh, uh, bring you to the, to the understanding why chemists somehow thought in the late 90s, when I was a, a graduate student, that catalysis basically is synonymous with transition metals. And 
Uh, in fact, the chemist view on, on asymmetric catalysis, where we try to make mirror image uh, molecules selectively in the, in the late 1990s was beautifully uh, defined by uh, Casey Nicolau and Eric Sorensen in a wonderful textbook, one of my famous, favorite textbooks in chemical synthesis, the classics in total synthesis, where they basically say that in a catalytic asymmetric reaction, you can either use an enzyme, as Oswald already knew, or you can use synthetic soluble transition metal complexes, period. And in a nutshell, this was really how chemists uh, viewed asymmetric catalysis. And with this sort of mindset, I decided I wanted to work with biocatalysis for my postdoctoral studies. And so I moved to the Scripps Research Institute and I was fortunate to work with Richard Werner there, a pioneer in catalytic antibodies. And he, together with Carlos Barbas, they have just developed an aldolase catalytic antibody, an antibody, a protein catalyst that like an enzyme, like a class one aldolase enzyme, would catalyze an aldol reaction between ketones and aldehydes to give such aldol products and typically with incredibly high energy selectivity. And so my first task when I came there as a, as a postdoc was to try to understand the mechanism of how this, I call it enzyme, actually works. And we had a crystal structure obtained of, of this antibody. And what I realized upon close inspection of the active site of this, this antibody was that there was an amino group provided by a lysine residue and also a a thiosine residue, a phenol group of the thiosine residue, where this hydroxy group was hydrated. And that, I speculated, would function as an acid co-catalyst. So it's kind of a bifunctional catalysis mechanism in which an acid and an amine enable the conversion of a ketone first into an imidium ion and then into an enamine. And then this enamine, assisted by this co-catalyst, the Brunset acid, would then react in a carbon-carbon bond formation with the aldehyde while this aldehyde is being protonated in this transition state. You generate the aluminium of an aldehyde, which is uh, of an aldol, which is then hydrolyzed such that you end up giving the aldol product. So that was the mechanism. And <clears throat> when, I, when I got the chance then to build my own laboratory starting in January, 1999, I thought, wouldn't it be fascinating if with this understanding, we were able to design small organic molecules that, like enzymes, would catalyze the same transformation. And, you know, from, from my mechanistic understanding, I, re I reasoned that all that would be needed for this catalysis uh, by the small organic molecule would be an amino group and an acid co-catalyst. So basically an amino acid. And that, of course, rang a bell. There was already an amino acid in catalysis. In the 70s, uh, proline, it was used, it was discovered in industry that it would catalyze certain intramolecular aldol reactions. They never were used on a, on a technical scale. And also somehow the mechanism was, mm, I would say, misunderstood. So people did not really uh, understand how it worked. And for me then, this was kind of the eureka moment already. I realized this is probably how proline catalyzes aldol reactions. It's like an aldolase, right? It has an amino group, the pyrrolidine nitrogen, and it has a carboxylic acid that could function as a Brunstead acid. And with, the, with this machinery, it could now convert, for example, acetone into an aluminum ion and then into an enamine intermediate. And this enamine would then react with an aldehyde, very much like the aldolase, with a protonation of the oxy anion in the transition state to give the aluminum ion of an aldol. And then the water molecule originally generated in this first step would then come in and hydrolyze this aluminum ion such that, that you get an aldol product. And when I did this experiment, I was shocked and, and uh, delighted to find that indeed proline would catalyze this reaction with remarkably high enantioselectivity. In fact, those enantioselectivity that we have obtained in this transformation um, were pretty much defining the state of the art. And at the time, this direct asymmetric aldol reaction was a big challenge for asymmetric catalysis. And there was only one transition metal complex available that could do this, of course, in addition uh, to these enzyme, enzymes that uh, people have used before. So, so that was the, the initial discovery, which is, has now been uh, 
recognized uh, with the big prize last month. Um, but in fact, it was not just this reaction. What, what really, I think, uh, made the difference was this mechanistic understanding, sort of this mechanism guided reaction design. And this has then led to sort of this concept, this more general concept or, or general generic activation mode of enamine catalysis, <clears throat> basically the idea that such an amine catalyst could would convert, convert a carbonyl compound, a ketone or an aldehyde into an enamine. And <clears throat> then with uh, the assistance of my great colleague, Ken Haug, we came up with also a tr transition model that would transition state model that would describe the reactivity of proline in such enamine catalytic processes. Uh, the enamine would be able to react with different electrophiles other than aldehydes and ketones. So, <clears throat> and in subsequent years, these are just a few arbitrarily chosen examples from my group. We could show proline catalyzes various uh, additional enantioselective, highly enantioselective aldol reactions, not only intermolecular um, <clears throat> aldol reactions of ketones with aldehydes, <clears throat> but also intramolecular aldol reactions, uh, enol exoaldolizations of dialdehydes with incredibly high enantioselectivity, transangular aldol reactions, but in addition to aldol reactions, also, for example, alpha alkylation reactions, that was really a very challenging process, catalytic asymmetric alpha alkylations, uh, Mannich reactions of different types were possible with high enantioselectivity, with aldehydes and ketones as nucleophiles, and even with acetaldehyde as a nucleophile, <clears throat> this was one of our uh, breakthrough papers uh, in nature, but also um, alpha CX bond formations are possible, for example, with aldehydes and uh, uh, hydrazidolation uh, becomes possible with high non-selectivity. And again, the field then started to become a field. Many, many groups, actually several also in Singapore, started uh, joining uh, uh, this area and contributed massively beautiful transformations. So this is just a small collection. And um, I was also happy to see that interest in industry rose a lot. Um, one example <clears throat> that I'm particularly proud of is the use of our intermolecular proline catalyzed aldo reaction. In fact, the modification of the Macmillan group in which two different aldehydes, um, aldolize, has been used by DSM in the Netherlands to make this aldo product, which is then straightforwardly converted into an antiviral reagent, an antiviral agent, Jarunavir. And um, the younger generation may not know this, but HIV um, was probably the worst pandemic of all times for humans. Several million people died uh, in the 80s and 90s. And this pande pandemic could only be uh, controlled, not with the help of vaccines, unfortunately. And the vaccines until today fail with HIV. Uh, so we're very fortunate with the coronavirus that we have good vaccines right now. But in this case, only small molecules uh, <clears throat> help uh, the patients nowadays. And currently, uh, HIV uh, patients take three or four uh, uh, small molecule drugs designed, as I like to say, and synthesized by chemists. And, and I'm happy, of course, that organocatalysis came to help in making this particular one. <clears throat> So over the years, of course, many, many other generic activation modes and, and thousands of different chemical reactions literally came out uh, of organocatalysis. And over the years, my laboratory, we have focused on one aspect of organocatalysis that we think is very, very um, exciting, and that is acid catalysis. Basically, one of the two elements of proline catalysis, which is also, as I said, uh, a Brunset acid. And we are so fascinated with acid catalysis because if you think about it, what acids need for catalysis is the, the existence of electron density. So that's the bare minimal requirement. But the beauty is that chemistry is all about electron density. And 99.999% um, of all chemical reactions and chemistry involves electron density, of course. And so there is this huge, huge universe of catalyzable reactions that we, in principle, could catalyze with acids. And what we realized over the years is that when you have stronger acids, and this is a pKa scale in acetonitrile, of course, when these acids get more acidic, they also become much more reactive catalysts. 
not only enabling much higher reactivity, which is, which is reflected in fast reactions and high turnover numbers, um, but also in the ability to activate less reactive substrates, right? The more acidic the catalyst, the less basic the substrate has to be. So this was one thing that we have realized over the years. And we have uh, now made chiral uh, Brunset acids that rival the acidity of so-called super acids, triflic acid and triflimid or magic acid, a very, very strong acid. But in, in addition, and that's now the key to this design, in addition to being very acidic, these catalysts are also highly selective. Now, how is that possible? This is possible because we have confined the active side of, of these catalysts. And this confinement is key in handling unbiased small substrates and in achieving high selectivity, typically uh, in anti-selectivity. And I can show you one of the crystal structure, actually of one of these catalysts, an imidodiphosphate, abbreviated IDP, where you can nicely see that this active site, this is where the acidity resides, is nicely confined by these bulky groups in the 3 3 prime position uh, of, of the binaural backbone uh, of these catalysts. <clears throat> and I like to say these are really magic chiral acids, and they enable uh, a number of really fascinating transformation, I would say unprecedented transformations. And I don't have the time today to show you all of them, but I would like to nonetheless show you four examples of what can be accomplished with IDPI catalysts. These are the strongest uh, of this family of catalysts. Reaction number one <clears throat> is an aldo reaction, a Mukayama aldo reaction, now using the acetaldehyde enol silane as the nucleophile. And the amazing thing about this transformation, of course, is not so much that you achieve high energy selectivity and that these aldol products are very, very valuable and that they are traditionally made in a more, in a more complicated way, typically requiring two or four, uh, from two to four uh, chemical operations. But the amazing thing of this reaction is that it is impossible to do with other catalysts, with open uh, active side catalysts, because as you have surely noticed, both the starting material and the product are alpha unbranched aliphatic aldehydes. And of course, normally, under normal conditions, without the confinement of the catalyst, this would lead to a polymerization reaction. And in fact, when you treat this aldehyde and the enol silane <clears throat> of acetaldehyde with a small amount of triflimid or triflic acid, a rapid polymerization results. This is, in fact, a known polymerization reaction. And with the control of the confinement, we are now able to limit this reaction to a single aldolization, which we were really excited about and just published a science paper uh, a few years ago. So <clears throat> these catalysts are also extremely reactive. I've mentioned this already, and we, they can be used on a large scale, um, you know, at least for, for our uh, laboratory, this is a large scale. We can use IDPI catalysts on a multigram scale in Mukayama aldo reactions of ketone acetals with ketones as the electrophiles. This was, I wouldn't say an unsolved problem, but there were only a, a couple of other catalysts that, of course, required much higher catalyst loading and either engineered substrates or several stoichiometric additives. And we found that with PPM loadings of our IDPI catalysts, um, such products can be obtained in multigram quantities and also with high energy selectivity. And we have a whole table actually of PPM loading uh, examples in this paper that was published in Nature Chemistry also three years ago. But I'd like to point out to you um, what that really means um, <clears throat> when you can approach a catalyst loading that is below one part per million. And yeah, I think I should say this for many years in the early days, you know, people would joke about organocatalysis, you need you know, this organocatalysis is not really catalysis. It's maybe a sub stoichiometric reagent that people are using. But now the situation is very different. We have now catalysts that rival enzymes in terms of turnover numbers. For example, with this system here, we can go beyond, below one part per million. For example, if we were able to use 0.5 parts per billion, uh, 0.5 P ppm, I'm sorry, 500 parts per billion, that would mean that one milligram of this catalyst would be able to produce one mole of the product, 388 grams. And on a technical level, that would imply 
that a kilogram of our ID Pi catalyst would be enough to make one mega mole of the product. So this would be 388 tons of the product, which is kind of the, the amount a blockbuster drug uh, is typically uh, required at. So one kilogram of a catalyst would make uh, 388 tons of a product. So that illustrates to you, I hope, the kind of sophistication that organocatalysis has reached nowadays. And last but not least, another unprecedented uh, chemical reaction, <clears throat> the hydro alk oxalation of olefins. And that was another big breakthrough, I would argue, for organocatalysis. Finally, the ability that we can also activate olefins. And that was, of course, the domain of transition matter catalysis for many, many years. And finally, we can use strong and confined acids to also engage simple olefins in catalytic asymmetric uh, um, function, hydrofunctionization reactions. And last but not least, the, the, the last reaction I wanted to share with you in the context of the strong and confined acid catalysis is a silyl cyanation of dupo-2-butanone. And that is actually so fascinating because the product of this reaction, this cyanohydrin, in this case, it's silyl protected, is an important intermediate in the synthesis of two pharmaceuticals. And that has led to the situation that all different types of catalysts for this reaction, and it's interesting, this is a reaction that can be catalyzed with any type of catalyst, with a transition matter complex, with an organic catalyst, and even with enzymes. And all of those have been tried for this transformation, but none has delivered uh, satisfying and antiselectivities. And even engineered enzymes only achieved an antiselectivity below 90%. So this is actually the first example in which an organocatalyst clearly uh, uh, sort of outperforms, I wouldn't say, but uh, reaches the kind of level of selectivity with small and unbiased substrates that is normally only known with enzymes. <clears throat> so I would like to stop here in talking about organocatalysis, but I would also like to share with you some thoughts of uh, uh, the future of catalysis. Of course, we don't Probably we're not going to make uh, so much more fuel and plastic in the future, but catalysis, I've, I've promised this in the beginning, will still play an important role in the future. And I think a, a formidable challenge for chemists right now is to create an artificial photosynthesis. I'm not the first, of course, to, to telling you this, but wouldn't it be beautiful if we could take like a tree, CO2 and water, from, from the air, basically, or the soil, and in the presence of light and catalysts convert this into kind of a chemist's uh, carbohydrate. And the chemist's carbohydrate is, of course, synthesis gas. You will see that it has the same formula, CH2O, and it's a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. And as has been discovered, I haven't had the time today to speak about it, at this institute, this with the Fischer-Tropsch process can be converted into fuel actually. And of course, the only other byproduct would be oxygen in this process. So it would be kind of a, a chemical synthesis of oxygen also. And this fuel then that is generated by a Fischer-Tropsch, we could, if you really liked your Porsche or your Mercedes, you could still drive it with the combustion engine because this would be kind of a sustainable way to, to make uh, uh, fuels, alkane fuels, uh, and we could still continue driving cars and flying planes and so on. And, <clears throat> but this is already being pursued. So there's a company actually, a startup company in Switzerland that is already doing this, and not very efficient, at least not competitive with, with uh, production of fuel from, from oil. But I think this could be a powerful uh, technology for the future. And uh, I'd like to finish uh, maybe not so serious, but perhaps, who knows, maybe serious, um, with the essence of photosynthesis, maybe as sort of a motivation for, for you guys, the, the next generation, this could be a, uh, maybe the most important chemical reaction that chemists have ever developed. So can you take CO2 and convert it in the presence of light and catalysts to oxygen and C? It's basically a deoxygenation of carbon dioxide. I would argue that this could be, if it would be realizable, the most important chemical reaction that chemists can work on. And I'd like to motivate all, all of you to think about this 
are there ways to accomplish such a transformation? Because with coal, of course, we can make anything. We can again make fuel if you want to. We can make materials. We can even build buildings. Uh, we can make essentially uh, all of organic chemistry from, from C in the form of coal. And it would give also my institute, the Max Planck Institute, für Kohlenforschung, for coal research, a new meaning if we were able to do something like this and produce oxygen, of course, in the process. Uh, and I think this would be really a, a lovely process. And I, I, as I said, want to encourage you to think about it. I mean, it's, it might be tough and it might not be possible, but I think it's, it would be a great process. And to make it even more challenging, how about not making coal in the process, but diamond? And with that somewhat not so serious idea, I would like to end my talk by showing you a picture from October 6. Uh, this is my group in, an, in a really excited state. We were all, of course, uh, uh, massively happy. You can see the big smiles in the faces. And um, I would like to thank my great group for, you know, being so enthusiastic about catalysis like me and, uh, yeah, being brilliant minds, working hard and, and being really dedicated, dedicating their love and their passion uh, for, for organocatalysis. I'd also like to thank funding agencies, the companies that have supported us over the years. Currently, it's BASF, uh, but also the European Research Council, and most importantly, of course, the Max Planck Society for giving me this incredible freedom to pursue my dreams uh, pretty much as I like to pursue them. I have great freedom in, in the topics I work on, and, and I have great laboratories and a huge group, and I'm very, very grateful for, for this enormous uh, trust and, and, and freedom uh, to the Max Planck Society. And last but not least, I, I didn't want to miss out in uh, sharing all the names of all the people who have worked in my group over the last 22 years. And with that, thank you very much again for having me here uh, today and um, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for giving a very inspiring talk. Um, now it's time for our question and answer session. Right. Um, maybe I will start off with a, a simple one. Uh, um, the first question will be, how easy and sustainable will you say specialized organic Organocatalysts are to make. How easy and sustainable? That's the question. Yes. How easy and sustainable are your specialized organic uh, organocatalysts? You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, that you can make them. You know, how how do you make your yeah. specialized um, yeah. organocatalysts? Yeah. As a as a organic chemist, I, I'm very optimistic, of course, that we can always make organic molecules. The beauty is in the past, the last century was the century of oil and coal and all the chemicals, all the materials, the catalysts and, and, and the dyes and the perfumes and the, and the pharmaceuticals were ultimately generated from those fossil materials. And of course, ultimately, that is probably not sustainable. At one point, we will run out of oil and coal and then we have to find new sources of, of carbon. And of course, I would say, and, and that's what I said in the very end of my talk, the most elegant source of carbon would be carbon dioxide, right? So let's create a new, uh, really sustainable chemistry that starts rather than ends with CO2. So that's that's one of my, my missions. But I'm very optimistic that this can be done. In fact, it already uh, is possible to do it this way. And ultimately, it's just a matter currently of of price, right? How much, how much is crude oil versus uh, how much would it be to make your carbon materials from, from CO2? Right. Maybe following it is, uh, following on with a related question. So to what extent do you think producing fuel using catalysts can be an alternative to electric cars? <laughs> Sorry, that I didn't understand. How uh, could so, organic catalysts be an alternative to electric cars? So to what extent do you think like we can produce fuel using catalysts, catalysis? Yeah. As mm -hmm. an alternative to, um, you know, using electric cars. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I, I misunderstood. Yeah. No, that's a great, um, that's a great question. I, I, as I said, I mean, um, my personal preference is an electric car 
because the electric car has many, many practical advantages. And not the least is it doesn't make a large uh, amount of noise. And it also doesn't produce toxic uh, exhaust, right? How beautiful is that in our cities then, you know, Singapore would be free of, of uh, exhaust, uh, um, uh, car exhaust. Our children would breathe in just pure oxygen. For, uh, I think I would, I would really like that. But having said this, I think there's still um, then a, a sustainable way in using combustion engines. For example, our planes, we cannot use electricity there. For some reason, it's it's te techno uh, technically uh, very very challenging, right, to fly a plane with with electricity, a big plane at least. And so, uh, we could do this then with good conscious conscious because um, we would produce the fuel from CO two, right, using catalysts. So, uh, yeah, I think this this would would free us from certain limitations if we were able to make fuel uh, um, sustainably. Right, certainly. Um... Mm -hmm. So in your view, maybe to, to a slightly different type of questions, um, what are the benefits and challenges of combining chemical and biocatalysts for synthesis? Um, so, so, and what concept should we keep in mind while developing such a scheme? Yeah, so I, I'm open to any type of catalysis. As I said, I really love catalysis, any type, like, you know, an enzyme, uh, even a transition metal, if it's not a very expensive or toxic uh, metal, or if you can recycle the catalyst. Transition metals are really unique in their reactivity, so they're also great catalysts. We concentrated on organocatalysts not so much because they are better inherently. I mean, of course, proline is beautiful because it's edible and non-toxic and so on, and certainly sustainable, but more because it was sort of an ignored field, right? So that was sort of what drove us. It's not with the message, these are, this is a better technology. Um, with regard to biocatalysis, I'm a great fan of this whole area. And it's it's really nice to see how, thanks to the work of Francis Arnold and Manfred Reitz and, and many other people, they can now sort of um, by directed evolution create biocatalysts that catalyze the chemical reactions we are interested in and that are may not may, may not be so much needed for, for life, right? In our bodies and so on and in plants. So that's really fascinating. And I also see that people are already um, working on combining um, biocatalysts with organocatalysts. There are organocatalysts that work in water. People have done this even in a one-pot operation. You have enzymes present and you have organic catalysts present and, and you have a whole cascade of reactions delivering uh, a drug molecule, for example. And in fact, you can co cat combine all types of cat catalysis and people are working on it. I think it's very, very beautiful and very promising and we'll get more and more um, into like a, a biomimetic situation where we have a situation that is ongoing in our cells. There are many, many different catalysts at the same time, and somehow everything is orchestrated, orchestrated in a beautiful and, and meaningful way. Sure. Thank, thanks. Thank you, Professor. Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe moving on to the next questions, right? Given, you know, how enzymes can be, you know, how nature evolves, you know, enzymes towards a particular functions. Do you think it's possible to evolve synthetic catalysts you know, in a similar way of how you know enzyme involves enzymes, uh, nature oh. involves enzymes. Wow! I mean, this the, the question I, I think I think is interested in also winning a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely this is, sounds like a very very good program, but not for a program for a weekend of research, but maybe for a lifetime. It's going to be really challenging, but nonetheless, you know, a formidable challenge. Imagine we could be doing this. I would be really, really fascinated. I mean, in in in, in one way, uh, you know, what what is so nice about evolution is you you have this this diversity of catalysts that you can generate so quickly and and so easily, right? Thousands and hundreds of thousands of different catalysts can be generated with small modifications in, in the DNA, and and but how do you? have such an information-based approach to the synthesis of small molecule catalysts, I don't know that. But, you know, congratulations for, for thinking about such, a, such an important question. It can really, I think it can shape an, a, a research institute with a, with a very nice program. Thank you for your in, uh, mm -hmm. wonderful comment. So in, in another uh, question, right, it's really about uh, industrialization of your catalyst, right? Yeah. Um, when, when do you think, you know, such a catalyst, right? Um, most of the processes are using transition metal catalysis uh, yeah. to, to, to produce things. 
how long do you think it will take us to to use you know to reach an era of uh, using you know organo catalysts okay. yeah is I it think possible it's possible to replace them yeah yeah I think in term I think it's this process is already happening uh, what I realized actually Dieter Dieter Enders just shortly before he died told me that he has done the the research and in terms of academic research asymmetric synthesis is nowadays dominated by organocatalysis, so publications, right? It's the number one approach to asymmetric chemical synthesis. I find this kind of remarkable. And I also am very optimistic that this will also happen in industry, little by little, of course. And it's not so much about replacing uh, transition metal uh, catalyzed processes, even though this is also happening. I, I think hydrogenation, it's, it's probably in terms of asymmetric small molecule catalyzed processes, the number one approach in industry right now, has, dis has disadvantages, right? You have to work with a, de a gas that can detonate. <laughs> I mean, it's nice, it's, it's kind of clean and, mm -hmm. and everything looks smooth, but you have to work with pressurized kind of dangerous gas. But there's also a scientific drawback of this uh, design, I would argue, and that is before hydrogenation, hydrogenating something, you need to establish a pi bond. Right, and the pi bond involves like a Wittig reaction or uh, Knövenagel condensation, but it involves some kind of additional chemical operation, and often producing byproducts. Right, so you have the pi bond formation and then the hydrogenation. It's a two-step sequence, and of course, all steps matter. Right, and strategically, I would argue, and that's my scientific point, organocatalysis often creates sigma bonds. Right, so you have. The, the two stereogenic centers already established in the single step. So I think there's even a strategic advantage sometimes of organocatalysis. I'm very, um, you know, peaceful. I don't want to uh, exchange anything. Um, I think all of these different approaches, transition metal catalysis, especially also biocatalysis, of course, this is heavily on the rise, thanks to directed evolution and organocatalysis will be used in the future. Right. Right, maybe a, a specific questions regarding your mm -hmm. recent uh, ID Pi catalyst. Mm -hmm. Right, the Thank loading you. is very impressive, um, but one main one other issues about organo catalyst is really is poor stability under for forcing conditions. Right, do you recognize this problem in ID Pi catalyst? Well, um, if it's if you uh, think about um, like high temperature processes, you know, catalytic cracking. For example, we probably couldn't use organocatalysts at 500 degrees. They would all burn, right? Like the organic material. I mean, that's, that's uh, I would admit, a limitation of organocatalysis. I'm happy to admit this. But fortunately, often there, I mean, the, the types of catalysts we are using now, the ID Pi catalysts, they're really at the frontier of reactivity in small molecule catalysis. They're extremely reactive. And often we have to cool down the reactions because they're so uh, um, so rapid and so exothermic. So, um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Probably they, they might not be the best materials currently. Maybe it, it changes in the future. You know, I always want to be open for, you know, more robust organocatalysts for, for high temperature applications. But, you know, there's plenty of, of low temperature applications, room temp temperature applications where organocatalysts work really, really well. Right. So thank you, Professor Liz. Um, mm -hmm. I, our time is up. Uh, maybe I'll end off with uh, just a final question, you know, with your parting remarks for us, you know, in regarding the creation of carbon and oxygen mm -hmm. from CO2, assuming yeah. that it could one day be possible, right? Uh, yeah. With someone really interested to know, what do you think will be the bottleneck of this process? Mm, as a, so, so for me, this is kind of a... this chemical reaction as a chemical reaction as a real chemical reaction is unknown and perhaps we will never be able to do it like convert directly co2 to cno2 with a catalyst and light i think it might be really really difficult to do because i mean you always have to keep in mind you generate coal you know carbon particles and oxygen so that's a very nice mixture for creating a fire right so the reverse reaction is much more preferred Right, so that that is already inherently challenging. You need to separate uh, oxygen as quickly as possible from from the highly flammable carbon material, right? But I'm thinking more in terms of, like, even if you think about, for example, making uh, um, like uh, plants. If you plant more trees, like billions of trees, 
the trees, in fact, are doing this already. They pick up CO2 and, in this case, water from the atmosphere and create carbohydrates. And if you would now use this material and just dehydrate it again, you would also generate coal, right? So in principle, this would be already kind of uh, the, or would be a realization of that vision, planting in an enormous amount of, of, of trees and then basically creating coal out of these trees, right? Because coal, you could put back into the soil and, and store it there as a carbon sink for the next, I don't know, thousands of years, right? Or millions of years, in fact. It's, we know it's stable, right? So this would be one way uh, to do this, but there are other ways like biocatalysis. There are now, they discovered bacteria that produce carbon. So somehow they make carbon, right? Isn't that fascinating? And then maybe with bioengineering and, and directed evolution, you can assemble uh, uh, bacteria that out of CO2 and water produce carbon, right? I mean, how lovely would that be? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Liz, for all yeah. your wonderful suggestions and inspiring talk. Um, mm -hmm. We have come to the end of our Q, uh, question and answer sessions. And thank you very much. And we hope to see you in Singapore very soon. Yeah. yeah, I will look forward to I hope I come this year or next year. Thank you very much for having me with you today, even virtually. And uh, yeah, it was great fun. Thank you. Thanks.